Patient AA, 25 years old, Filipino, born on May 1, 1995, Catholic, married, residing in VNG Tacloban City, was admitted for the first time in EVRMC on January 24, 2020 with chief complaint of labor pains. 20 hours prior to admission, patient experienced labor pain with a pain rating scale of 4 out of 10 with uterine contractions lasting not more than 30 seconds every 5 to 30 minutes. She describes the pain as cramping which starts from the front abdomen radiating to her lower back. No other associated symptoms like nausea, vomiting, headache, and spotting noted. Six hours prior to admission, the contractions became regular, lasting 40 to 60 seconds every 3 to 5 minutes. This was associated with whitish discharge and the pain now starts from the back going to the front. No other symptoms noted and no medications were taken to alleviate the pain. One hour prior to admission, labor pains intensified with a pain rating scale of 6 out of 10 with uterine contractions lasting approximately 60 seconds every 2 to 3 minutes, which now prompted the patient for consultant EVRMC. May high blood kami, ma'am. May diabetes, asthma. May allergy kami pagkaon, may lucina. May goiter. May nakamulahi, ma'am, kung high blood. May diabetes. Patient had her menorque at the age of 15 years old. Her menstrual cycle is regular every month with an interval of 28 to 30 days and usually lasts for 4 days. Patient soaks up 4 to 5 pads per day with normal flow and no accompanying symptoms such as dysmenorrhea. Her last menstrual period was on April 24, 2019. Patient is G1P11000. The patient had her first sexual intercourse when she was 22 years old with her first husband. There were no significant findings on her review of systems. The patient's temperature, maternal blood pressure, pulse rate, respiratory rate, and internal examination were done upon arrival at the OVAS with a 4 cm dilation of the cervix. Process that leads to childbirth. There are four mechanisms of labor fatal lie, fatal presentation, fatal posture or attitude, and fatal position. Labor entails the interaction of the so called five P's passageway or the birth canal, passenger or the fetus in the placenta, power or contractions, position of the mother, and psychological response. The birth of a child is a very special occasion which transforms both uterine and cervical function. No butter the stages of labor. There are four stages of labor. First stage is the clinical onset of labor or the period of dilatation and effacement. Now this begins when the mother starts having regular uterine contractions and these contractions are referred as true labor contractions, which progress in frequency, duration, and intensity, leading to childbirth when it causes the cervix to dilate to 10 centimeters. Now this should be distinguished from the irregular and ineffective contraction, which is the false labor contractions, also called as Braxton Hicks contractions. Stage 1 is divided into two phases, early or latent phase and the active phase. Cervical dilation in the latent phase is 1 to 3 cm. Prolonged latent phase is defined as greater than 20 hours in a nullipara and 14 hours in a multipara. The cervix or the opening to the uterus begins to soften, efface or thin out, and dilate or open. These cervical changes are necessary so the baby can pass through. Usually, there is rupture of membrane or a woman's water breaks during the first stage of labor. Contractions or tightening of the uterus become strong and regular. There may also be a stringy bloody discharge from the vagina called body show and this is considered normal. Active phase occurs when the cervix starts to dilate more quickly from 3 to 5 cm. Dilation rate for nullipara is less than 1.2 cm per hour and less than 1.5 cm per hour for multipara. Contractions get stronger, last longer, and occur more often. The cervix continues to open wider to about 10 cm, then pushing can start. 
in the second stage of labor, the child is born. This begins from full cervical dilation and ends with fetal delivery. The median duration is about 50 minutes for nulliparas and about 20 minutes for multiparas. Once the baby's head starts to come out called crowning, a provider guides the rest of the baby out. Childbirth is finished when the baby is completely out of the vagina. The provider then cuts and clumps the umbilical cord which connected the mom and the baby during pregnancy. The third stage of labor involves expulsion of the placenta. During pregnancy, the placenta provides food and oxygen to the fetus. Once the umbilical cord is cut, the placenta has to come out. Contractions typically begin 5 to 10 minutes after the baby's birth. During this time, the placenta detaches from the uterus. A provider may encourage the woman to push just as she did the to deliver the baby. The fourth and last stage of labor is the recovery phase. Now this begins after the placenta is expelled from the uterus and ends when the mother is stable and transferred to the postpartum unit. Temperature, pulse, and blood pressure are evaluated at least every 4 hours. If membranes have been ruptured for many hours before labor onset, or a borderline temperature is elevated, the temperature is checked hourly. There is seldom any real need for this in the normal pregnant women, at least until analgesia or oxytocin is administered. Foods are withheld during active labor and liver. Gastric emptying time is remarkably prolonged once labor is established. In bed, laboring women should be allowed to assume the position she finds most comfortable. Most of the time, this is the lateral recumbent position. In general, pain relief should depend on the needs and desire of the woman. If the membranes are intact, there's a great temptation even during normal labor to perform amiotomy. The stension of the bladder can hinder the descent. Women is encouraged to avoid, but if not possible, catheterization is indicated. The fetal heart rate should be checked immediately after contraction at least every 30 minutes and then every 15 minutes during the second stage. If continuous electronic monitoring is used, the tracing is evaluated at least every 30 minutes during the first stage and 15 minutes during the second stage. For women with pregnancies at risk, the fetal heart auscultation is performed at least every 15 minutes during the first stage of labor and 5 minutes during the second stage. Continuous electronic monitoring may be used with evaluation of the tracing every 15 minutes during the first stage of labor and 5 minutes during the second stage of labor. Although usually assessed by electronic monitoring, contractions can be both quantitatively and qualitatively evaluated manually. With the palm of the hands resting lightly on the uterus, the time of contraction onset is determined, as intensity is gauged from the degree of firmness of the uterus achieved. At the acme of effective contractions, the finger or thumb cannot readily indent the uterus during the firm contraction. A time at which the contraction disappears is noted next. The sequence is repeated to evaluate the frequency, duration, interval, and intensity of uterine contractions. During the first stage of labor, the need for subsequent vaginal examination to monitor cervical changes and presentic part position will vary considerably. The Friedman's curve is used as a gold standard for rates of cervical dilatation and fetal descent during the active phase of labor. The labor curves divided on the basis of expected evolution of the dilation and descent curves into three functional divisions. The preparatory division includes the latent and acceleration phase. It is marked by little change in cervical dilatation and is arrested by sedation and conduction of analgesia. The dilatational division is a phase of maximum slope of dilation where there is a rapid rate of cervical dilation unaffected by sedation. The pelvic division encompasses both the deceleration phase and the second stage which is concurrent with the phase of maximum slope of fetal descent. To fully understand, we will try to make a graph. The x-axis represents the hours of labor and the y-axis on the left is cervical dilatation, on the right is the descent. 
we will plot the cervical dilatation as 0 and fetal descent as x. In this case, we have a 25-year-old G2P11001 of 39 weeks AOG. Upon admission, or in the 5th hours of labor, she had undergone IE revealing 5 cm cervical dilatation station negative 3 with intact bag of water. So we will plot this 5 cm on the 5th hour of labor and negative 3 on fetal descent. During the 7th hour of labor, the cervical dilatation is 6 cm with negative 2 station. On the 9th hour of labor, cervical dilatation is 8 cm and it's station 0. We continue plotting and then connect each circles and axis. Most hospitals have a policy of routine vaginal examination every 3 to 4 hours to check for the progress. This table shows abnormal labor patterns, diagnostic criteria, and methods of treatment. 